cover. It's on. If I showed you who I really am, would you and I still be okay? See, the thing is, I used to trade money for love. And I know I can see you thinking, no, that's not what I'm talking about. But the truth is, I used to trade position and possession for love. Well, love is what I wanted, it's what I was yearning for, it's what my spirit truly craved. But most of the time, all I got was attention. The sad thing about the story is, I'm just but one of millions of South African men who suffer from this grossly underdiagnosed but deeply widespread disease. A disease that is rooted in shame. A disease that keeps us prisoner and an idea of perfection. It's a disease that sees a young man pull himself out of one of dire straits, get a job, start to earn an income, and with that he starts to build some degree of wealth. But at some point this young man finds himself deeply indebted. In fact, according to a report, the National Credit Regulator's 2018 report, he constitutes 52% of the 1.7 trillion rand in consumer debt that is now an issue. That's because at some point this young man started to buy things he couldn't afford to impress people he didn't know, who didn't know him, and didn't care about him. When we sit together, we make jokes about it. We say we use our black cards to buy big houses, big cars, and big bottles to impress big lungs. <laughs> this disease is another man. From what most people would consider an obscure little township, some call it a village, in an obscure little province somewhere in the country. This man goes on to travel the world, performs in front of millions and millions of people, entertaining them and leaving them in smiles. Comes back to his own country, makes a bit of money. But then at some point, the fame starts to disappear. And with it goes the money. He finds himself standing, looking around and observing, and saying to himself, I used to be the guy who walked into a room and say, Mosok Iman, and people knew how to respond. I was the guy who made Stwana fashionable. I know at this point some of you are like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. <laughs> Ask the guy next to you. <laughs> but he finds himself in a position where he's no longer the famous one. He's no longer the one making the money. And then he starts to reflect on his life and he asks himself, was it worth it? Am I worth it? Am I enough? And then he makes a decision to take his own life. According to our research, three out of every nine men will take their lives as the result of this disease. Shame is killing black men. And I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, okay, KG, we hear you. What makes black men so special? Outside of the obvious, you know. <laughs> well, the truth is, Toxic shame is something that you and I all suffer with at different levels and different ways. And in fact, let me explain that the kind of shame I'm talking about is not the shame that you and I might be familiar with. This is not the shame you feel when for some reason your body at 1 a.m. in the morning decides, ah, it's time to get up, KG, downstairs is where you should be, the fridge is where you should be, and audit of the things in the fridge is what you should be doing. <laughs> some of us know that feeling. No, that's, that's not the shame I'm talking about. No, is it the shame where, uh, where are the guys? Where when we find ourselves stuck in sand and traffic on a morning listening to Alex and Co., you suddenly realize that, hey, son, I didn't clear my browser history from last night. <laughs> yeah, you can laugh, I know, it's in, there in your head right now, you're thinking about it. <laughs> Some of you didn't clear it on your way here. But no, that's not the kind of shame I'm talking about. <clears throat> because you see, that shame is actually quite healthy. It's the kind of shame that keeps us accountable to each other as a society. And no matter our delusions of grandeur, it's the kind of shame that reminds us that we're actually not God. The shame I'm talking about is a shame where we don't look at things and say, that thing is shameful. We say, I am shameful. 
And then we ask ourselves, if I am shameful, am I worthy of what is essentially one of the most basic of human needs? Love. If I showed you who I really am, and I mean like who I really, really am, would you and I still be okay? You and I both know that our country has a history. And it's a history in which a certain part of the population did not have access to certain rights. And in case you don't know, I'm talking about the black part of the population. Let's clarify that, right? And with that, it meant that they did not have access to opportunity and to exposure. And after many lives were lost, a few freedoms were gained. And with those freedoms came opportunity and exposure. But with it too came the unseen. And buried deep in the unseen was a tremendous amount of pressure. Buried deep in the unseen was a toxic amount of expectation on a generation. An expectation that said that failure was no longer an option, not on the blood of Robert Sibukwe, not on the blood of Chris Hani, not on the blood of the many who died for you to enjoy the freedom that you enjoy, the opportunity and the exposure. And so a generation of young men grew up with this understanding of masculinity, an idea that the only way I matter as a man is if I have something to show for it, position and possessions. And so we wake up every day and we put our armor on. Some of you, your armor involves and includes a tie. And we step out into the world and we go and hunt. We hunt and we pillage. And we come back with the little that we can gather and we stand in front of you and we say, here it is, I've got it, here it is, can you see it? Is it enough? Am I enough? Am I worthy? Do you love me? <laughs> also, let's not forget, this happens at a time when Instagram matters more than Instagram. At a time where we celebrate people for the number of likes they have as opposed to what they truly are like. And so that belief is entrenched over time. And we continue to believe it. If I showed you who I really am, would you and I still be okay? <laughs> but God forbid, because we all know that life isn't linear, right? God forbid that in your narrative, you never get to be the guy with the black card who can buy the big bottles to impress the big bum. God forbid that your story takes just a little longer than mine. What then? Who are you then? Are you not worthy of love? And what happens? What happens if you actually get to that place where you amass the wealth, where you gain the position? But then again, because life isn't linear, you lose all of that. Who are you then? When I ask you again that if I showed you who I am, and I want you to think about this, who I really, really am, would you and I be okay? I wonder what your answer would be. We fear that answer because we fear the loss of love. And so we find ways to cope. Some of the ways we cope is that we start to pretend. We buy things we cannot afford to impress people we don't know who don't know us and probably don't even care about us. And that's how we find ourselves in debt. Another thing we do really well is that we defer. We defer love. We defer meaningful connection. We defer living because we don't truly believe we deserve it. Another one of the things we do is that we kill. We kill ourselves. We kill others, both literally and figuratively. We work ourselves to the bone in the pursuit of position and possessions. And when we don't get it, we start to ask ourselves if we are worth even being here. You see, for me, <laughs> I was lucky because 
in my story, I met people who saved my life. Some of them are actually here tonight. And they didn't know that they did that. But let me share with you that I suspect, much like you, I grew up in a home where academia was revered. My mother was a teacher, like one of those strict, strict teachers. I think we all know them. We've had one. You don't even call a teacher, you call her ma'am. <laughs> right? And what she used to do was that when I would do well academically, she would reward me with attention. But I was young and I couldn't distinguish the difference between attention and love. So when I would excel at school, she'd call me KG. Well, she wouldn't call me KG. Get out. <laughs> Come here. Speak that English that you speak with the twang. And I'd do that, right? <laughs> but what was happening was that I was starting to associate doing well academically with love. And that programming set in. Then life happened. It passed. And so the boy became a man, and school became the real world. But that same belief remained. So I adapted. At a very young age, I thought, hmm, how do I hack this system? So I started a business. Because with a business, I could amass wealth, and I could become somebody. I could be a founder, I could be a CEO, I could be an MD, possession and position. At 19, I got into radio professionally. I, before you, Alex, remember when they used to call it Joburg's number one hit music station? 94.7, high felt stereo. That's where I started my radio career. To some, it might seem, well, he was just trying to get into radio. No, to me, I was chasing position, to be somebody. And I had some of those things for a short while. But again, life is not linear, and I lost them. And I remember sitting with myself trying to understand, why do I feel so terrible? Why do I feel so lost? Why do I feel so alone in a world where I've got millions of followers and listeners and people who like and love the things I do? And I remember one particular night sitting in a Santin Hotel parking lot. I was sitting in a car, because I couldn't have been sitting on the floor. That would just be weird. <laughs> but I know it was cold because the seat warmers in the car were on. And let me clarify, there's levels to cars, I guess. Seat warmer is here. And I know in telling that story and the way I'm telling it, it paints a picture, right? Santon, hotel, car with seat warmers. But what I'm not telling you is the reason I was actually in that parking lot was because I had nowhere else to go. I had been evicted. And even with the millions of followers I had online, or the hundreds of thousands of followers I have online, I felt like I had nowhere else to go. I tell you about the car and its nice seat warmers. The reality is that car wasn't even mine, it was a sponsored vehicle. I never told the girls that though, obviously, because. <laughs> and after, the security came and knocked on my window and said, hey, Baba, you can't sleep here. You can sleep in there, but you can't sleep here. I remember getting on the phone, and for the first time in my life, and in a very, very long time, being forced to be naked. I got into the car, got on my phone, started driving. And I drove to my then-girlfriend, who, I have to say, as of two nights ago, is now my fiancé. Let's see if you guys are clapping in 10 years. Give it time. Let's see. <laughs> but I drove to her, and for the first time in my life, I was forced to be naked. Because when I got to her, I had nothing to offer. I had neither possession nor position. All I could give her was me. And she did something that was so foreign to me that even today I still struggle with it. She said, just as you are, you are enough. And she introduced me to some of her circle. And they said the same thing, and this was very foreign to me. And so I used to go back to old ways of thinking and, and start to talk about the things I used to do, the business I had, the shows I used to host, because I thought I had to bring something to the table. When my late mother passed away, I remember sitting in her car when she dropped me off at work. Not my mother's car, because she was late, I guess. Sitting in my girlfriend's car, 
and not even having money to get into a taxi to go and bury my mother. And again, I was terribly naked. And whether she knows it or her friends know it, and the ecosystem that she brought me into knows it, they saved my life. Because much like Jabba, I started to ask myself if I was worth it and I was enough. The thing is, my story cannot be one of those stories that is a unicorn. Because if we were to truly start to talk about a standing nation, it has to be one in which men can stand in their truth. It has to be one in which men don't have to subscribe to this idea of perfect masculinity. Because God forbid they don't tick those boxes of position and possessions. Who will they then be? And as opposed to a standing nation, I suspect we will be a limping nation. And let me change the question and say this. If the man to your left or to your right was to show you who he is, would you and I, or you and him rather, still be okay? I leave you with this. As we go back to our different homes, all we need to do is to look at the man in our lives and ask them if they are okay. And here's what's going to happen. Yeah, bro, I'm fine. And then once all of that is done, ask them again, but are you really okay? And maybe with that little bit, we will start to stand, and the men in our nation will be healthier for it. Thank you for your time.